Well, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the 2016 Alumnus of the Year Lecture at the Divinity School. This is an annual event sponsored by the Baptist Theological Union and enabled by the work of the Divinity School's Alumni Council, which solicits the nominations for and selects the awardee. I want to say a word about the Baptist Theological Union because I happen to think that it's a good idea on an annual basis to invoke publicly in this community the work of, of the Union. Established with the founding of the University of Chicago in 1890, the Baptist Theological Union afforded the financial basis for the establishment of the Divinity School as the first professional school of the university, not to mention the vast majority of its faculty. Yet another product of the skill of William Rainey Harper, the Union morphed from the Morgan Park Seminary, an American Baptist institution, into the non-denominational professional school devoted to the education of ministers and professors. What can seem to a time like today is strikingly binary about the study of religion. Uh, think, for example, norm, for example, of normative and descriptive or theology and religious studies uh, as a form of a kind of intellectual jujitsu is in fact the reflection of a unique and visionary commitment to the complementarity in curriculum and advising of training for the professoriate and for religious leadership. Chicago is today the only institution in the United States which, which retains with one faculty and one curriculum that dual commitment. And it has been regarded through much of its history as preeminent in the accomplishment of its faculty, the achievements of its students, and the innovation of its programs in the study of religion. That is not, in my view, an accident. This was enabled by the Baptist Theological Union as founded and over the century since as administered by its Board of Trustees. It's a special pleasure to recognize the members of the board whom I will now ask to stand for their work on behalf of the institution. Thank you. Now, as I noted, the Alumni Council of the Divinity School is charged specifically, in addition to uh, consulting with the dean, uh, with the solicitation of nominations and the designation of an alumnus of the year. So Peter Kaufman is their fault. Um, but I would like to ask all the members of the Alumni Council here present today to stand to thank them for their work on behalf of the institution as well. I have to say that it was one of the more gratifying parts of the day for me. It's been a great day, but all of it. You're all, I've seen all of you in different places today. It's been a great day all around. But uh, to talk to the Alumni Council this morning about the structure of the institution and to hear from them a kind of public affirmation from different walks of life of that vision was very gratifying to me. Now, to our speaker. In the academy, decisions about appointment, promotion, and tenure pivot on assessments of scholarship, teaching, and service. On these scales, Peter Kaufman is truly an academic man of parts. <laughs> he joins us today in each of these capacities um, at noon to discuss pedagogy in the craft of teaching program, and now at 4.30 to reflect on scholarly work with us. Um, the man of parts, you will see if you saw him at noon, and you will note again today, is at the same time one man of a piece. Um, each of these parts is exemplary in itself. And for the noontime session today, and now in the lecture, um, the expertise of the teacher's craft and the knowledge of the scholar meld together and give us some sense of an occasion where the sum of the parts can be, uh, the total of the sum of the parts is greater than merely the addition of them together. Peter Kaufman is the George Matthews and Virginia Brinkley Moglin Professor of Leadership Studies at the Jepson School at the University of Richmond. He is also, since 2008, at the same time, Professor Emeritus in the Departments of History and of Religious Studies at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill, where he taught on the faculty for 30 years, from 1978 to 2008. Um, the CV that you can get for Peter only lists the things he's done since he became a full professor. And it's still pretty long, including six books and close to 50 articles on a wide range of topics in Renaissance studies um, and leadership studies and the like. 
Uh, one of the things I will say is that it is striking to me that Peter's career describes a movement from a fascination with documents to a deep ethical concern for the undocumented. That's to say that many of his publications focus on Renaissance textual traditions and their recension, uh, but his more recent work has focused on immigration, on the underprivileged, and on bringing education to those who would not otherwise get it. It strikes me as, as remarkable and apt and deeply resonant with what I tried to identify in the BTU, that we have here someone who is at once an intellectual historian and someone who is courageous enough to shift gears completely late in life and become the humanist among those who are thinking about leadership for the future of the country. Um, it's relevant to note that Peter's unusually wide, it's relevant to note his unusually wide and deep commitment to institutional service. Um, he said at lunch today that he is, is unpopular enough that he's not elected to committees at the University of Richmond, but I can tell you that's a lie. He's on about nine there, and he was on about 15 or 20 at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, um, including a significant investment in uh, the program, uh, the uh, Scholars Latino Initiative, for example, National Endowment for the Humanities Initiatives and things like that, besides promotion and tenure, policy committees, and those sorts of things. He's a very active academic citizen. Um, at Richmond in his so-called retirement. He's on the Athletics Committee and the Athletic Council. He has strong opinions about the University of Virginia, I can tell you that, which I think I strongly suspect are sports-based, but that's just a guess on my part. The Library Committee, the Committee on Faculty Status and the like. Um, he's a man who really devotes himself wholeheartedly to the institutional context in which he's serving and has done so always by referencing Chicago as a place that was very important to him. A book that Peter assigns in classes regularly, I was delighted to see, is Robert Penn Warren's All the King's Men. And those of you who know the book will know its narrator is named Jack Burton. And Jack Burton spends the majority of the book following Willie Stark around, and Willie Stark was a stand-in for Governor Huey Long of Louisiana. The book ends with a phrase which I think is resonant with how I think about Peter Kaufman. Uh, Burton is resolving himself to the assassination of his mentor and to responsibility that he has abjured by following someone else. And he says, we're going to leave here, and we're going to walk out of history and into history and the responsibility of time. I think that's not a bad epitaph for Professor Peter Kaufman. Please join me in welcoming him as the 2016 Committee. My students will appreciate reading those 650 pages now to get to that last line, but thank you, Rick. I'm honored, honored to be here, and I'm, I'm very grateful to be home. For me, uh, Swift will always be bedrock University of Chicago. And my thanks to Clark, and to Margie, and to Rick, and others for presiding and preserving and just progressing. It's so wonderful to be back here. I want to thank the committee for inviting me back, honoring me. I want to thank Bernie, Martin Marty, Bob Grant, and I really, really miss right now Jerry Brower. I want to thank them for making me. And I want to thank you for honoring me with your, with your presence. So my title first, a little perplexing, I know. When asked, I thought that I would hug the coastline, give you something that's already been vetted, something that's going to come out in, a, in a, my book in December, the last chapter on Augustine's Statesman. Um, it's a, chat, a book about Augustine and authority. But uh, for a while now, for a number of months, I've been working on uh, something to do with the next one. And uh, I was just not going to share with anyone for quite some time until my colleague uh, at the University of Richmond dropped a, a uh, Wall Street Journal editorial on my desk. Leonardo DiCaprio meet St. Augustine, it said. <laughs> the, the gist of the editorial is that 
we are so fascinated, apparently DiCaprio, I haven't seen the movie The Revenant, but has made a, a film that's about two and a half hours of ordeals. Um, and the gist of the, uh, of the editorial is that our, our eagerness to see those ordeals uh, probably derives from our uh, pleasure in dipping into that well of compassion that Augustine spoke about. I'm going to talk about compassion a little later today. I haven't seen The Revenant, so I can't talk about Leonardo. But for some reason, perhaps it was the name Perhaps it was just the, the, the desire to put you through something of an ordeal. Um, and I've, uh, I've decided to share not only the last chapter of the last book, but what may be the last chapter of the next book, and it may be in the next 30 minutes, the last chapter of my career, who knows at this point. <laughs> so, Giorgio Agamben, meet Augustine. Every summer for the last five years, a dozen or more of my colleagues who write about Augustine and political ethics gather together. Some are veterans, Bob Dodaro, who started us off as the head of the Pontifical Institute for Patristic Studies in Rome, uh, UFC alum uh, Chuck Matthews from UVA, Paul Griffiths at Duke, and our host this July, uh, Eric Gregory at Princeton, and a number of younger scholars. As Eric says, we all of us think of Augustine as, and I quote him, an unexpected contemporary. To most, he is a resource for public theology, that would be Chuck's term, for a robust civic humanism, that's Eric. I think not. Yet I do believe that we can be faithful to Augustine's chilling sense of late Roman politics and discover something timely and useful and historically defensible in his work. Something about his expectations and his frustrations that speak to our expectations and our frustrations. This is about 48, 49 minutes, if you don't laugh at my jokes, and I have, in the interest of time, provided few and bad ones. So no problem. But I always like to beware when things are uh, when things do come to a close. I take seriously Augustine's colleague and first biographer, Bishop Posidius of Kalama, who intimated that his subject edged into the give and take of politics apprehensively and as Eva Elm says in her Ungern, very very grudgingly. To be sure, his were exceptional times, as many of you know. His sea was deeply divided between Donatist and Sicilianist, now Catholic Christianities. His spheres of influence, the provinces of Numidia and proconsular Africa, were flooded with refugees, especially after Alaric had descended upon Italy. Arguably, the times demanded enthusiastic engagement in issues of justice and security. Yet for Augustine, Cicero's conclusion that justice was the aim and essence of statecraft seemed off base. The lack of genuine justice, vera justitia, was, Augustine said, a distinctive feature of government. Little worry, though, the stakes for Christians were not as high as those for pagan political theorists who thought the polis a principal context for human fulfillment. The polis was not unimportant for Augustine. All to the good, magistrates, proconsular legates, local curialis were to keep the granaries filled and ideally to prescribe Donatist secessionists. But what Augustine most wanted from statesmen was trust in God's grace and sovereignty, exemplary humility, prudence, compassion, pessimism about their chances for perfecting righteousness in this world in hoc seculo maligno de civitate dei, book 18, and he wanted their faith in the celestial fate of the faithful. And he stayed the course he set for himself in the 380s. He might have been more conventionally ambitious. But if we trust his confessions, composed 10 years after the fact, he backed off very soon after he arrived in Milan 
in 386. He had come from Rome looking to make a mark politically. To that end, he delivered orations and collected clients, yet he became disenchanted with political maneuvering, he tells us. Clients paid him to flatter them, trumpet their virtues, blow smoke, and advance their careers. Who knows, a coup or two in public relations would likely have landed him a place among the statesmen he served. Yet telling lies about the highly placed to their colleagues, he said 10 years later, had demoralized him. The highly placed and wannabes hoping to advance in what he came to call the business of Babylon understood all too well, he later lamented, that good reputations were salted by, with uh, exaggerations. So in Milan, even before his baptism, Augustine renounced secular ambition, contempta spe seculi. At just the time, according to his confessions, he took Christianity quite seriously. And he returned from Italy to Africa as a servus dei, self-styled, a contemplative, heading with several colleagues to his family's estates in Thagast. He did not go to Carthage to work with the proconsul. Uh, he did not go to assist the governor of Numidia in Serta, uh, collecting revenues, uh, maintaining public works. He returned to the gas to study and to talk. Why I come back to Chicago, actually. Although his years in Italy were few, he would have been seen as Romanized in the large cities in Numidia and proconsular Africa provinces where he spent nearly all his time from that time in the early 390s to his death in 430, had by then accommodated Roman rule. You would imagine, and you'd be right, that Rome's conquest of the Carthaginian Empire much earlier stirred resentment for generations. But the Punic port settlement in which Augustine served as priest and bishop had, by the first century CE, commissioned statues to honor Emperor Claudius, a sign, it seems, that some citizens were resigned to their fate. Intermittent insurrections attested that the countryside remained hostile to Rome's occupation well into CE. The occupiers took advantage of the plots within plots, the factions within factions. Pacification was not a high priority. Rome's representatives were more interested in managing than in extinguishing local factions and feuds that kept applicants from uniting against the empire's garrisons. Excellent studies of this by Marcel Barabou and uh, Claude Lapelli. Augustine, though, by the fourth century, had reason to see things differently. He appreciated officials' willingness to collaborate with Catholic Christians, to prescribe pagan worship and dismantle Donatism, which worried him from the time he assumed pastoral duties in the early 390s and well into the fifth century. But his correspondence and sermons suggest he appreciated that provincial and metropolitan authorities were working within a very narrow imaginative range. The Christians among them craved celebrity as did their pagan peers. Now Augustine thought that Emperor Theodosius, the exception, a statesman whose humility was noteworthy. The first chapter of the book from which this is taken to the last chapter, uh, discusses Augustine's view of the emperors, uh, Constantine and Theodosius especially. My argument, which I find persuasive at any rate, is that uh, his admiration is far less intense and uh, 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 far less intense than my colleagues have imagined. Neither to Theodosius nor his son and heir in the western portions to 423, and that would be Honorius, would have had influence, though, without provincial governors, their legates, and the local curiales or civil leaders with whom Augustine had to deal. We might think of these officials sent from Rome or appointed from African stock in the fourth and the early fifth centuries <clears throat> as cartilage strategically positioned to reduce friction in Africa, unlike their predecessors as I mentioned before. Friction between pagan and Christian, the Romanized and the still resentful, 
Donatist and Catholic until 403, town and country. Augustine acknowledged self-interest complicated the enforcement of edicts, in this case mostly Theodosius's edicts, against all, save the feckless few. The Donatists and pagans capitalized on local authorities' reluctance to offend. So no discernible drift toward Catholic Christian theocracy in Africa, as Marianne Ka in a recent study developed their own or concludes. Theodosius and Honorius had opened rather than closed debates between Christianity and paganism. But the trains ran on time. Economic, thus political life in the African provinces at the time exhibited signs of considerable vitality, leaving pastors and bishops the challenges of ensuring that statesmen among the faithful behaved less as masters of their region's destiny and of their own and more as pilgrims passing through. The challenge and the context are defined differently by colleagues who imagine Augustine proposed, I'm quoting, a genuinely political ethics. Joseph Clare, young scholar, fine new book that's out last month, just came out, says as much, creatively spinning Bob Dodaro and Eric Gregory and Chuck Matthews as well as Augustine. Joseph claims that I have overlooked many, his term, and I put it in bold here so I could really, many, many letters to public officials. Neil McClinton and I have commented on how few Augustine wrote. I count only four that look as if they're about to offer what Bob Dodaro calls a theory of Christian political conscience before pulling back. Four of hundreds of letters and hundreds of sermons, many treatises, The City of God, all of which explicitly posit the mutually exclusive teloi of practices that give politics and Christianity their identity forming capacities, specifically, respectively. On the one hand, the perpetuation of Roman rule by any means, and on the other hand, the cultivation and promotion of personal righteousness. To cite just one bit of Augustine, he preached that as this world, terena regna, passed away, period, perished, the faithful's formidable task was to long for the celestial and see that they love others as brothers. Love and compassion. Political reform was not to be expected from statesmen. An end to misery in this wicked world was not in the offing. In this wicked world, in hoax secular maligno, misery kept humanity company because inordinate desires or concupiscence afflicted every human will as punishment for humanity's original sin of disobedience. You all are familiar with that. But a quick thumb through the city of God should persuade you that for Augustine, the political was not just an extension, but an amplification of humanity's misery-freighted, sin-filled predicament. Despite, and perhaps because of divine oversight, Felix Culpa, the world seemed to spin away from God, putting a premium on gain, encouraging ambition and greed. For the Christian statesman, the problem was how to serve this wicked world without being carried away in its direction. But the faithful were pilgrims in this world, headed in a different direction. Yes, with crates of discreditable desires, although Augustine enjoined them not to unpack and act on them. He would have them become martyrs at heart, statesmen especially. That is to face temptations with an ear, ascetic self-discipline. And above all else, they must mistake, they must not mistake politics for piety. The glory hounds around them sought notoriety by expanding their regime's reach and touting civic virtues, which Augustine thought only unschooled or irreverent or opportunistic onlookers mistook for genuine virtue and for integrity. And I want to say that the annotations for those last two paragraphs 
uh, draw from not only his uh, very early work, the Contra Academicus, some of his early work, but go all the way to his late work. This is not a development in Augustine, but a rather constant theme. May we surmise that that theme, Augustine's opinions on this count, were shaped by his experience of late antique politics and social climbing, confessions reported, um, about um, shaped by the, uh, uh, the Curiales in Hippo, about whom he often complained, or after 410, uh, shaped by his encounters with the many emigres in Africa, particularly those of senatorial rank, and many of their inhospitable hosts in Africa, clutching respectively at what was left of their possessions and what they would not share with newcomers, all of them traveling with the world in the wrong direction, parishioners ready to defend to the last shell whatever shards this world left them. In 411, Augustine welcomed Tribune Marcellinus to Africa. And Marcellinus is at the center of the case I rather consistently argue against. He came as the emperor's representative to end the century-long conflict between Donatist and Catholic Christians. He summoned bishops of both persuasions to a council in Carthage, as some of you will know. In early summer, they came. Now those colleagues, our colleagues, trawling for Augustine's political theology, presume that the final of the council's three sessions was the culmination of late antique political Augustinianism. After all, Augustine, for his part, stressed themes that catered to government interests, pairing the universality of the Catholic Christian Church with that of the empire. The psalmist, Pentateuch, the prophets, gospels, and Pauline epistles, he said, composed a resounding rejoinder to Donatist sectarians, who, he drew his conclusion from their secession and their subsequent militancy, identified only select African Christians as heirs, heirs to the gospel, as true Christianity in illo tempore. Compare them, the Donatists, the sectarians, to strays, he urged. Then compare Catholic Christians all around the Mediterranean to stars in the heavens and to sand on a vast seashore. But in their time, as far as we can tell, the Donatists outnumbered Catholic Christians in some African provinces. And to show as much, their bishops entered Carthage en masse and implored Marcellinus to take attendance, to check credentials, as it were, during the council's first session. They probably hoped that Count would counter Augustine's splattering of stars and, and sand all over the council. Yet Augustine out-talked and outmaneuvered the dissidents. He correctly gauged what any statesman in Marcellinus' position would have wanted to hear about peace in the African provinces, especially given setbacks elsewhere in the empire. And he conferred with the tribune before preparing a concession. Should the tribune rule against the Donatist bishops, they could retain their sees, unite with Catholic Christian colleagues, and restore the church's unity. Uh, it was a complicated formula for liturgical roles when two bishops occupied a single seat. But the Donatists recoiled, and for those of you who know something about them, predictably recoiled. They were desperately committed to purging Christianity of impurity. They were sure their rivals contaminated the faith. Augustine and his colleagues were bogus bishops. Their consecrations were invalid. The baptisms and ordinations they performed ineffective. The Catholic Christians, Augustine, proposed a concession that they knew would be attractive to Marcellinus, repugnant to their rivals. I find Augustine cunning and disingenuous here. Eric Gregory might cite the concession as evidence of what he calls Augustine's openness to the risk of political dialogue. Look where that's getting us these days. Be that, that was not meant as a joke, that was meant as a lament. Be that as it may, sorry, be that as it, as it may, uh, for my reading of the Bishop's Statesman and his political disenchantment, the aftermath of the council is most significant. 
Predictably, Donatist bishops refused to consider the two bishops one church solution, and they were prescribed in 412. Marcellinus stayed in Africa and was granted near proconsular power, one infers, to compel reconciliation. The Donatist default position was as it had been after Emperor Constantine had condemned the African secession a century before. I use Petillian, a dissident bishop of Serta, as the example of Serta in Numidia, when he argued that it was lunacy and vile to give the government any say in church affairs. Not so, said Augustine. The faith could be well, if not perfectly, served by faithful statesmen, by Marcellinus. <coughs> Jim Wetzel, propping up the last proposition, actually makes it sound rather subdued, writing about the ragingly imperfect terrestrial city. For there was no remedy on offer there, no potential in political culture to counter humanity's servitude to envy and ambition. There were consolations, Solacea, as Augustine acknowledged in his City of God. Humans were creative and procreative. Networks of arteries and veins attested the creator's craftsmanship. Humanity was inventive, and the improvements in health care and navigation were epic. Even culinary advances made humanity seem convalescent and not fatally ill and ill-tempered, but conspicuously absent from Augustine's inventory of consolations was any meaningful political amelioration. Marcellinus, had he survived, might have given Augustine cause to say otherwise. And that would delight my colleagues who are bent on turning Augustine into something of a Clinton Democrat. Uh, I, either Clinton, either Clinton. Yet the inventory of consolations which precluded the political was composed after Marcellinus fell victim to what scholars now call a political witch hunt. Here's the little we know. The Roman Senate was wary after Heraclian, who was then uh, doing consular service in Africa, was appointed consul in 413. He sailed from Africa, landing in Ostia with an alarmingly large entourage. The court led to believe the new consul meant to unseat the emperor, sent troops that uh, intercepted Heraclian, turned him back across the Mediterranean where their commander had him executed. And then in a mopping up purge of sorts, uh, the uh, Marcellinus and his brother, one of the very few other statesmen with whom Augustine carried on a correspondence, they were executed as well. Augustine sent to the special envoy who succeeded Marcellinus a brief, prudently restrained account of what he thought about the hastily and tragically improvised punitive expedi expedition. The bishop's despair and dread, however, are impossible to miss. He stressed the awful cost of political intrigue. With Marcellinus gone, a reunification of African Christianity seemed remote. Some comfort came with the tribune's posthumous exoneration. For Augustine, dedicating his city of God to Marcellinus, had a magistrate cum martyr on the title page of a narrative repeatedly recommending that Christian statesmen cultivate sentiments of their faith's martyrs. And what could that mean? Certainly martyr magistrates would have a vexed relationship with those who relied on them to protect their right to possessions. Yet Augustine supposed that Christian statesmen would be inclined to give greater weight to constituents' long-term interests, greater weight than to their immediate material needs. He wrote as much to Marcellinus. He wrote as much to Marcellinus in 411. And briefly want to, to inject in here the more dramatic uh, more emphatic insistence on just that point uh, that takes play that you will find in correspondence with uh, uh, a procurator, uh, Nectarius. Nectarius had proposed that after the pagans had in Calama, about 70 kilometers from, uh, uh, from Hippo, in, and uh, where Augustine, uh, uh, Augustine's diocese and Augustine's sea, yeah, Nectarius had proposed that the long-term interests of Christians and pagans alike would be well served if the Christians, instead of demanding punitive as well as compensatory damages, forgave the, um, the pagans 
uh, and uh, looked further along to a peaceful coexistence. Augustine rejected that. Politically prudent, pragmatic, for he was more interested in the longest term interests that would be served by learning how precarious their possessions were in this world. Poverty was the key to the kind of learning and repentance. A repentance motivated by the fear of destitution or poverty could very easily be feigned. A repentance and a love of God that stemmed from poverty itself would be, in his mind, sincere. In his terms, it was best to learn non amat numum qui amat deum, love and longing for God are antithetical to obsessions with possessions. Creative paraphrase on my part. Statesmen truly serve God and their constituents. Statesmen who do truly serve God and their constituents would be guided by just that. Now it's time to move from Augustine statesmen and from um, the coastline I've been hugging for a while uh, to swivel and turn to uh, where I hope to be many, many, many months from now. But not before recommending that you consult the exquisite section on uh, the virtue of longing, Martha Nussbaum's term, term in her upheavals, where longing slides gracefully in both senses of that term, uh, gracefully into places in theology reserved for platonic contemplative ascent. And Nussbaum also helps me make the turn by having suggested that it can be useful to consider Augustinian thoughts on ideal social relations with no explicit religious commitment. I would have, oh, a month ago or two, talked about this as selective secularization, but now uh, knee deep uh, in Agamben and his uh, marvelous apology for profanation, I call it a uh, liberating profanation. Uh, and adaptation of Augustine. So let's profane. The radical Augustine starts modestly enough with his distinction between caritas and cupiditas. Another of ours, Jean Elstein, elaborated perceptively on Hannah Arendt's chapter New Beginnings to sketch, quote, a new social life defined by mutual love. And I will be really elaborating on that, going where perhaps where Jean might not have wanted me to go. But let's see where it takes us. It is neither this new social life confined in or defined by the church, that new life and stretching it a bit with material from Augustine's sermons and Orationes and Samos' other sermons, an assortment of polemic and especially a city of God. I'll say new communities roughly corresponds with what Giorgio Agamben conjures as Cheviena, the coming community. Why Agamben? The ferocity and trajectory of his reactions against the onerous constructions that conventional wisdom force upon, forces upon subjectivity and intersubjectivity match Augustine's. And in addition to what he says about signification and profanation, still a bit out of my comfort zone, Agamben also composes pithy volumes on ecclesiology, Catholic liturgy, messianism, Pauline epistles, and the 13th and 14th century Franciscan quarrels with the papacy, my favorite of his books. So I can sift Agamben, and I can still claim to be an historical theologian. Skeptical well-wishers, who see me sifting him, uh, tell me, well, wish me well luck, but wish me luck as I sift, they say, for gems uh, in gibberish. But I do have friends, two uh, uh, alums, among them Ryan Coyne, who may be here right now. Maybe not. Brian Britt, um, who are far more familiar, so I, they permit me by looking over my shoulder from time to time and correcting me to boldly go uh, where I've not been before, but I am a, a, an inveterate poacher. My mistakes, I hasten to add, are my mistakes. First, let's admit that Amy Elias might be right, characterizing postmodernist protests as symptomatic of their paranoia 
about their, our normativizing cultural order. Safe to say that paranoia is not proof that they, Agamben's commodifiers, a state of exception, are not really out to get us. They may well be. I'll leave better informed critics to browbeat the critics. As for Augustine, he was skittish to say the least, both about the draw of paganism in late antiquity and about the allurements, blandimenta, of what I call a city of God, G-A-U-D, city of God, C-U-P. Cambridge University Press would not let me use this as a subtitle to something I did for them on dystopia, but I smuggled it by them twice in the text. A city of God. So don't be shocked to find Augustine's remarks about cupiditas or concupiscence and about the insatiable desires to acquire territory, wealth, glory, parked alongside Agamben's relentless references to a consumerist euphoria that distinguished what he describes, borrowing from the French Marxist Guide to Board, as a society of spectacle. Easily define us as well. The point of such pairing would be to illustrate, yet again for me, the comprehensiveness and pervasiveness of Augustine's critique, but also to prepare to illustrate how radical an Augustinian alternative community in and to this wicked world would be, a community that would be founded on alienation and sustained by compassion. I'll try presenting it as defensively Augustinian and Mirabilitic to perhaps even postmodern. Alienation, then. At the end of the City of God, Augustine clarified that reforming one's understanding as the apostle directed in Romans 12 would require a degree of nonconformity and estrangement. One becomes a resident alien, a pilgrim in this wicked world, and that dates not only back to the earlier part of the, uh, uh, of the De Civitate, but also to earlier treatises on true religion and even on his catechesis. One becomes a resident alien, a pilgrim in this world. Previously, if we may trust his confessions, he contemplated forming communities of this sort in Milan and at Kisikiakum, perhaps at Osti as well. He went to the Gas with Lippius and others, as you've heard, apparently to form a knot of interlocutors. Toward the end of his career, he told parishioners that he had come to Hippo, a layman, to assemble a society of friends to live communally. On becoming diocesan, he moved his monasterium into the bishop's residence, and he never ceased hankering. Is that the right word? Hankering? Longing. Longing is good enough. Longing to be more fully among them. Agamemnon tells us that only communities sojourning in diaspora and incessantly emerging can successfully disbar, his term is deactivate, impulses to achieve power over life and to preserve the power of life. For such communities repudiate codifications that undermine the power of life, or, he also says, the form of vivendi, a pattern of life. Gemeinschaft, which encourages intimacy, wherein one, confront, wherein one confronts infinity, comes in the wake of Gesellschaft. That's not Agamemnon or Augustine, sort of borrowing from Jean Luc Nancy and, and John Macquarie there. Maybe we escort Augustine back into this discussion, though adding that he often identified the successful reform of life, be ye reformed, with a quality of compassion, a duty, officium dilexionis, a duty to love neighbors as well as God. Also often, he worried that the world had grown inimical, that the affection of true friends for each other, all for each other, neared extinction in hoc seculo maligno, in this wicked world. Corresponding with Jerome early in the fifth century, pardon me, need some room there. Corresponding with Jerome early in the fifth century, Augustine characterized such affection as compassionate healing. He specified that what happened in such hygienic encounters fulfills the psalmist's promise that the upright heart brings equity with love, an equity irreducible to law. Uh, there's an epistle that's often called Augustine's Rule. It reads to me far more like a uh, manifesto than a law code or regulations. But that can be debated, and that's one obstacle I've got to clear before I move much further. 
Do we call Augustans and Agamben's non-juridical approaches to their coming communities compatible? Certainly not if we dwell on Augustine's celestial city, although Agamben's critics call his emerging community eschatological as well as utopian. But Agamben refers to his coming community as penultimate, and I think the term fits communal arrangements Augustine favored. August, Agamben's improvisational, sometimes riddling style complicates matters. He theorizes emerging communities so suggestively, but only gives in his volume on, to, on the topic the Tiananmen protest as an example. Commendable, he says, because it is its spirited defiance was radically devoid of any ascertainable, representable uh, identity. Militant belonging without conditions of belonging and without any identity to vindicate a Gondon like that. Augustine, I'm guessing, Augustine, I'm guessing, would not. The bond of belonging was critical for him, but was a form of vivendi, a pattern of living sufficiently similar to the one Agamben reconfigured elsewhere to sustain our coupling a bit longer. Augustine set an irrepressible compassion at the center of his preferred pattern or form of living, a compassion that making brothers of others enlarges lovers, ambo de la timini, lovers and the loved alike. It builds solidarity, structures desires, cracks open possibilities. Agamben would love that. Lifts spirits above surging lusts, corruption, and tyrannies that masquerade as civic piety as Agamben's spectacles of exploitation and commodification. Compassion might not stop the tanks, but making martyrs sensitivities conspicuous and contagious, it sustains resistance and rehabilitation. In his hymn to, hymn to love, in the eighth book of the De Trinitata, Augustine, Bernie's probably wondering when I was gonna get to this, uh, Augustine put the prospect succinctly, the gift of love that loves, the love it finds in others and encourages in others, finds fulfillment in God. The passage suggests spontaneity, but Augustine was predominantly, uh, preeminently, a seasoned pastor. He had to motivate congregations, to inspire a general disposition, to forsake exploitation and commodification. Hence his sermons sometimes appealed to self-interest, to longest term interest. To lay up treasures in heaven, Matthew 6, parishioners must redistribute treasures on earth. Aiming higher, so to speak, Augustine introduced martyrs to commend their unimpeachable humility, to inspire the faithful to cultivate a longing that was quite contrary to the conventional desires to acquire. One of his sermons on the Psalms depicted the martyr's longing for a love that differed from Amor Sui, pervasive in this world is intoxication. Martyrs get drunk on hope and driven by that different love, stitching themselves into communities that exist now, mode of now, pen ultimately, with a different hope, faith, and love, the last of which pays God's love for creation forward in compassion for others. The annotations here are mostly from his sermons on the Psalms. In, August, in Augustine's treatise on catechesis, oh, I think I could do this in rap. In Augustine's treatise on catechesis, talk of inebriation gives way to a description of pleasures friends experience when they take others to a favorite place their friends had yet to see. Their host's fondness for that seascape or that sacred text, as well as for their friends, increases. Admittedly, Augustine composed no sustained, radical, communitarian alternative to the decadence he deplored. Nevertheless, he spins similes and amps up the power of compassion so it may become so formidable that it allows friends figuratively to dwell within each other, habitamos, in in vice. Is that too close for Agamben? It's hard to tell. In a slender volume, aptly entitled Mezzi Senza Fine, Means Without Ends, he concedes that his coming, always emerging community, attende ancora la mente, still awaits a mind ready and able satisfactorily to conceptualize it. 
But Augustine's penultimate reality, much as Agamben's depended on deactivating or neutralizing obstacles to cultivating the alternative hopes, faith, and love that constitute it. Agamben's ideals occasionally seem to amount to little less than a boundless interrogation of potential. But as we edge nearer to Q&A, let me offer a few clarifications and elaborations that could justify docking Augustine alongside Agamben's community to come. He and Agamben considered their penultimate realities, uh, equating their penultimate realities with churches of their times. Pache, John Milbank, uh, Augustine did not. Both decided against it. Agamben thinks of churches of his and our time uh, that they accommodate rather than challenge commodification. One result is the popularity of what John Milbank has disapprovingly called intermediate associations. He thinks them un-Augustinian. For me, it ain't necessarily so. Jean Elstein called them, I like this, civitates in miniature, populated with pilgrims, that would be Augustine, with sojourners, that would be Agamben. They may be cells or seminars, places or occasions at which Augustine commented, discase et doces, you teach, you learn, places or occasions at which the welfare or deliverance salus of each is the welfare or deliverance of all, deliverance or salvation by expectation, by longing, by compassion and edification. Breath. These penultimate realities and alternate alien venues are a way forward for Agamben and Augustine. Pilgrims or sojourners populating them are not wholly apart from this world. Agamben and Augustine countenance some significant withdrawal or decathect from what um, the, uh, the latter called the din of this world, strepitum forest din noise outside, to foster and sustain the pattern of life that sustained uh, emerging communities. Agamben agreed with Augustine, moreover, without citing him, alas, yet explicitly advising that the world be used, neither enjoyed nor possessed. He called it living messian messianically, vivera messianicamente, signifies significa usare, use. In one of his several iterations of the distinction between use and enjoyment, and of his rehearsals of the abysmal consequences that followed when creatures confused the two, in this interest, in this instance, addressed to Faustus the Manichae, so it obviously would be Augustine. Augustine also, and for us again, stipulated the importance of compassion, truly calm passion, inasmuch as lovers love the love of God in their friends. That compassion does not seem dissimilar from what Agamben identifies as a love that bears and hopes all things, that carries lovers away, trasinato, from the commodified quotidian, intoxication. <coughs> we are drinking after this, right? I mention that because we are nearing the end. I plan to unleash some Agamben on my friends in July when they said about politically operationalizing, that's Eric Gregory's phrase, politically operationalizing Augustine's Ordo Amoris and promoting an Augustinian civic liberalism. I likely refrain from detonating Agamben's telling charges that liberals, oh, so rosy, naive notions of citizenship and statecraft, nozioni in Genoa, lead to unanticipated exclusions and even persecutions. They also, he says, keep us from driving what he calls fictions of sovereignty into crisis and from positioning the sojourner or refugee, refugiato, not the citizen, at the base of a renewed political philosophy. I'm not certain there's room at that base for Augustine's pilgrims. Still, borrowing from Agamben, who enjoys juxtaposing authors millennia apart, I'd say there is something to be gained, trying to make the result, the constellation, intelligible. For, for Agamben, he was speaking of, of the relationship between the Apostle Paul and Walter Benjamin. To conclude then, too much of Augustine, some of it rehearsed here. His change of heart in the 380s, <coughs> His disappointment, 
in the affair of Marcellinus, his replies to Nectarius, his distress, generally all of which and more drawn into his striking appraisal of the city of God, I've said it again, ought to give greater pause to our colleagues who have Augustine as a paladin for what passes as democratic citizenship. I cannot see what they see in celebrating contemporary political culture, which may explain why my friends and I see Augustine differently. Only fair then to say a bit more about the origins of what you've kindly and patiently heard today. You've already heard a bit about it. For the last 15 years, I've been working with resident aliens, economic refugees, peregrini, sojourners, in the Scholars Latino Initiative, SLI. We have been, and maybe again, outside the juridical and underground railroad to higher education for courageous and tenacious undocumented youngsters, often called in the friendlier press, dreamers. Our communities, high school students, university undergraduate mentors, families, teachers, coaches, community partisans, re-narrativize the history of immigration in the United States. SLI is not an advocacy group, but an intervention animated by a different hope, faith, and love, different from the virtues, and I put that in quotes, often associated with American exceptionalism. So my experiences, quite, quite surely, with Sly and before that, in the late 60s, have led me to read Augustine and now Agamben differently from colleagues still optimistic about political culture. Now you may find my version of Augustine's pessimism extreme, many have, and Agamben's staggering, which may be my fault. You may find the resources for radicalism in Augustine wobbly, I'll fix that, and Agamben's coming community unbecoming or too obscure. Even so, please entertain my two last requests. Should April's political rhetoric become political reality after November, please remember this last hour and have your places of worship become sanctuaries in all senses of the word and conjure alternatives in compassionate communities to the ugly, irascible populism likely to perpetuate political gridlock at best or worse, persecution. Second, whatever November brings. You might recall, as I often do, what alum Chuck Matthews says in his chapter entitled Hopeful Citizenship. He identifies Augustine as a principal source. I disagree, but I think he's correct. Humans need stable ground, I'm quoting him, from which to see all else as contingent. I think he's right. As you reread Augustine, please do. Test my assumption that ground prepared by a city of God, confession, sermons, Correspondence and treatises is radically different from the terrain we ordinary tra ordinarily travel. Consider whether his work on um, the libido dominandi, the lust to dominate, or the libido principandi in the confessions, the lust to be first. Consider whether his work inconsistently perhaps, after all he is Augustine, yet no doubt provocatively nudges us to endorse the idea that statecraft necessarily soils hands rather than solves problems. Some of you will recognize Michael Walzer. Coaxes us to find alternative venues, communities, schools, seminars in which to address problems Augustine and Agamben summon us to care deeply about. I am exhausted. <laughs> well, thank you very much. <laughs> Yes, please. Uh, my thoughts aren't so well formulated at the moment. There are some that arose when we were talking. <clears throat> what I missed in that is what was also paramount 
for Augustine. And that is the initiative of grace. And that is, I look back to uh, his sermons on the Eucharist. The Eucharist, where your mystery is on the altar, means that you go out and empowered by the charity that is God, that you have, you love. Mm -hmm. And through. we resist. So the, 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 the question is, I love this axiom, sometimes it doesn't seem to work, but mostly it does, that everything's received according to the mode of the receiver. So people have to be prepared to receive grace and the preparations itself grace. So you get a, a circular kind of thing going. But that was the one element that is so strong in Augustine that I missed uh, in what you were saying. Yes, it wasn't there, and there's no no way of. Uh, I mean, it's in the chapter in this this last book. There's um, you'd, be, you'd be very very pleased to see it there when we're talking about pastoral leadership, pastoral authority, because the movement within precedes the movement outside for Augustine. Um, in that, the the only justification I have of deleting that uh, in this. Uh, presentation, and, and you're quite right to spot it, is uh, that little paragraph where we talk about selective secularization or profanation. What is it that actually liberates for Augustine is not what liberates for the postmodernists, obviously. Um, that movement of grace or divine sovereignty, divine recognition. Um, my sense, though, is uh, that um, Augustine would not balk, would not my, my, my hope is that Augustine will welcome me if I uh, uh, remind us all that very often uh, that that movement within which is often, it, which you, you know who says is indiscernible, you cannot tell who's got it, who hasn't got it, is activated if we deactivate the, the, what encumbers it, what, what uh, blocks it, the conventional wisdom. Um, the, uh, what, 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 uh, what we call the, the commodification, the basic commodification, or the society spectacle, which is common in and Augustine, and I think you notice here. So removing the obstacles to that movement within um, would, uh, and, 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 and within a community or a compassionate community would work. But it would not be, it, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm about at this point drawing the two together in conversation but I cannot find anything that would match my colleagues who are familiar with postmodernist pretty might, uh, uh, might help me and my, ma match the sovereignty of grace, uh, the sovereignty of God and the universe. Well, the sovereignty has, and I think, and Augustine has to be moderated by the operation, cooperation, mm -hmm. that are simultaneous mm -hmm. and mysterious. That's why grace the rain falls on the just and the unjust, and the just grow and the unjust don't, I guess. Well, now, I don't know how that works. That's an excellent entry. Uh, we will never know how that works. So, uh, and omitting grace, although that, that, that seems against us, and I grant you. The question is, how do we know when it's working? In ourselves, maybe, but not in another. Not in another. Well, I'm going to suggest that one way we know is that when we love the love and the other which we believe derives from God, or we believe that love comes from the same source. And that would take place in these, uh, the, what some of my colleagues call the tertium quid between the terrestrial city and the celestial city. The problem is that they too often magnify that as the secular world, or uh, I'm limiting it to these caring communities, compassionate. Um, it's 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 a it, it's a stretch. I know it's a stretch, but I will. And thanks to you, I will in the preface of the next book uh, say my last book is about Augustine, and I think you'll really like that. But this book, this book is about how I can deploy Augustine that I'm doing too much violence to his immediate concern, but some violence necessarily so because we live in a post modern society. But I would never. Forget that prior to the race and quite right. Please.
Uh, could you talk about leadership? And if so, the Divinity School is the uh, first profession school here on campus alone. Uh, I'm sorry, the first? It was, uh, it was over earlier that the Divinity School here was the first profession school among business law of medicine. Uh, do you think that the Divinity School in general has a, a construct of leadership that's unique versus, let's say, the business school on the Yes, uh, I mean, I love, I can only speak from personal experience. Um, and just go back to some things you were talking about earlier. Uh, professionalization requires uh, a skill that I, I've turned elsewhere, performing. You have to know how to manage what you've got and make your way through it, and perhaps incrementally to change it to improve it. But in terms of envisioning, you're not going to go back to Jill in a much, much larger question. Of, of of integrity and of grace, the the stuff that's needed to make truly uh, transforming vision, I think, takes place in the arts and humanities. And for me, in the late 1960s and early 70s, it took place on this corner in CTS and Swift. I don't go as far back as some of our colleagues did, but I see a lot of the union, the our colleagues. But that's what I found here. Um, a willingness to entertain truly transformative leadership, truly transgressive leadership, to step to, to call conventional wisdom what it is conventional rather than wisdom. Don't get me fun as much, you know, because I, my school is right next to the business school and on the other side of the law school. They're about making professionals uh, performatively effective and not necessarily transformatively. Um, that is unfair. It, uh, but this is my experience. I've had unfair as it may be, that may be the role of uh, uh, both of the studies in the arts and the humanities. And uh, is, that, is that helpful? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, our office student spent a number of years as a monk, right? I spent a lot of time. Oh, not you. <laughs> Spent a number of years as a monk. Well, and isol isolated. Is that well, yeah. <laughs> not, uh, yeah. he yearned for it. Yeah. Uh, he, in, in Milan, he was seeking to experiment with a community of close friends who would uh, perhaps experiment with self esteem, but certainly isolate themselves <laughs> for learning conversation. Uh, I think he wants to put some very strict arm on. But that didn't work out too well because some were married and their wives got in the way. Uh, we weren't too keen on the idea. Um, in Pascal, there were several instances in his life where he was he lived reclusively in a community of like-minded souls. But uh, but he became from the time uh, he was he was made a priest in 291. He returned to Africa in 388. At that time, we don't know too much about it except that he lived in that community. Uh, and as you said, I mentioned, he went to you know, to, to uh, create, uh, again, that community. So maybe three years, maybe three years of blood. But then his work, uh, he has work, work on uh, the monks. He yearns for that time. He yearns for that time away from the noise, the clamor that, that is breaking. So your questions. I'm so sorry. Okay, my question is that uh, you know more, more about all this thing I did. I was under this pressure to spend much time alone by myself. I'm also under the pressure that a lot of our balance um, uh, and, and, and our stability and, and our character come from our interaction and interfacing with other people. Um, from your knowledge of all did you know the sign of a uh, intensity or, or imbalance in his communication and his expression as a result of what well, I would think would be a result of his isolationism and, and, and his uh, uh, distance from other people. Did, as, as an expert in all did you notice anything in, in his writing? Uh, I, I think that his, uh, you, you may, well, well, you're right, you don't know that much. So much uh, had to spend time and had to come. But much of the writing is complex to mine. So much of it, uh, I've at least come down to us. 
Um, so I, I'd say, I guess I'd say that the balance goes more, less to the uh, records and more to the um, cash flow service, the, the past uh, man on others. Mm -hmm. uh, and as his reputation is controversial, because of his incredible erudition, grew, he was called upon time and time again to combat those uh, outside or on the vertical view of faith. So I'm not sure I'm able to see much to say that um, I don't think his, his life is an template of um, that affected his leadership as a as a pastor. Is that yeah, and for, well, for, 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 for the little I know about Augustine, much of his writing is very intense. Oh yeah. Okay, and and you know intensity is kind of like a, you know, on the scale of sea salt scale. You know intensity is you know there up here. Intensity is the imbalance. You know, so that, that's what I was wishing. Uh, I I got to I got understand. So how would you, uh, how do we make sense of this resonance between Augustine and Agathon? How did you, uh, how, how did you personally combine them? Is it a, like a, something that we can find in like Western political theology and then secularized political theology to political theory, like it's uh, genealogy or how? <laughs> the question was, uh, how did I, how did I find the two? How did I couple the two? Uh, is there a history of, of, uh, of, of uh, uh, in contemporary political or public theology that weds the two of them? Um, you know, Chuck Matthews is an essay, a very short essay that, that, uh, that disputes the dominance both uh, of uh, people who are one of the ones and wish me well. I'm going to be here, but he's not final. I found a dominant in a very unusual place. I was reading for a class I was doing on Coriolanus, and there was someone who adapted in, a, in an article in uh, a dominant homo soccer, one of his, his entire series, to <coughs> Coriolanus in such a magic way that I had to read a dominant, a very dominant, and it, as you can tell, I, I, you know, it's tough sledding for me. But certain things play. The, the importance of the refugee and the pilgrim, or the soldier and the pilgrim, is the, the importance of the diaspora. His book on that, on the most absolute letter of poverty, uh, 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 is, is remarkable. It, 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 it mentions what I learned from what he did about the Franciscans in the 15th and 14th century, and lifts it to a relevance to the 21st century. If things started in action, uh, the, the book that I would really write about, the chapter, the chapter on the building and on, you will know it, and Hannah uh, Arnes, uh, another uh, folks in the moment. But then, you know, I read a nominee analysis, I know I read Wall Street. Wall Street Journal was known, this is, this is still, uh, you can catch me in six months from now and help me out, so I'll take the name. I had a with Brian, and Brian, and maybe you guys can through. I'm thinking much can be gained by putting them together. Even though, as just pointed out, something is really lost, and I'm sure something will be lost from Ghana by this constellation. But putting the two together and the trajectory of their argument, the images that they use, well, Ghana does a big level of Augustine. Ghana writes very little about Augustine, and he is not fond. Maybe he is. Peter, can I summon you up here? Oh, yes. Oh, my God. So one of the... One of the... Shh. <laughs> see? Come on. All right. That wasn't in the script. No. No, one of the great traditions here is uh, the presentation of the alumnus of the year with a plaque. And I want to read the inscription and present it to Peter. For his passionate, ongoing work to ensure access to higher education for all, for his prolific, influential research exploring the intersection of religion, culture, politics, leadership, and education. For his excellence in pedagogy ranging from high school to advanced graduate levels, from leadership studies to courses on religious leaders in late antiquity. The Baptist Theological Union names Peter Ivor Kaufman, alumnus of the year 2016. Congratulations.
good look. <laughs> so friends, um, let's go downstairs to the common room where we can continue this conversation and where we have a special um, unveiling to take place. So thanks for your attendance and thanks to Peter Kaufman.